All right, another draft physics video presentation. I had to make sure. Actually, it was a presentation. Uh, public. Uh, on the air. Whatever that is. Anyway, making a video. And it appears that I am making one. Uh, close enough. Anyway, so I thought I would talk about interferometers a bit and, you know, challenge the physics uh, people. Okay, like a Piero, he, he says, I, you know, he went to college and he knows some physics and he's competent and all that kind of stuff to, you know, explain it to us all. So, uh, yeah, I'm seeking the explanation. Um, so, um, the other subject they've been sort of ignoring, like I've been seeking the, for example, um, I've basically identified that in the two slit experiment, the two interior slits create the envelope pattern and the two exterior slits create the little bars and it works just right <laughs> you know that's what actually happens if you change the outside you'll change the little bars how big they are and you change the inside you'll change the envelope uh, what other video what other paper what other anything anywhere explains that simple fact that's the challenge for the trolls, is to find the explanation uh, where somebody else stated that as a fact of the experiment. Gave a clue to people about how the trick is done. Anyway, so the interferometer has some gaping, huge problems that I haven't heard any explanation for how you get, how you, how you get around these huge, gigantic problems in what they say they're doing. So the basic idea, forget about all the mirrors and all the bullshit, the basic idea is you send a beam of light one direction and you send another one the other direction. But what you're really trying to do is just measure the difference, okay, in when the beams of light arrive at a location, okay, and, and you're trying to see if there's any difference, you know, so they're equally start and then you just try to see if there's a difference in where they finish and if they finish in a different way then you can say something moved something changed um, to change the finish line and they're saying that they can measure you know one ten thousandth of the width of a proton with this device uh, which is an insane statement um, uh, but anyway, so I can't find any way to justify it when you know how the thing actually works. Um, but anyway, uh, so sort of in theory, this just gives you time, right? So the length, how long you make these beams of light go, the only reason you, you have a length to the, to the experiment is to give you more time to collect the change, right? If a change is happening really, really, really fast... Um, you know, in, in something's position, well, then you're not so, it's not going to be so hard to detect it. But if the change is happening too slow, I mean, it takes time for the change to happen, you need the experiment to keep running so you can collect the whole change. Um, so we're talking about the speed of light, which is incredibly fast, and so obviously it has to be a very fast change uh, for this experiment to work. And so the longer you make it, the more time you give whatever the thing you're trying to measure. So the idea is they're trying to measure some sort of gravitational waves that are theoretically nonsense anyway, but let's say they exist or something like them exists. Um, so the idea is is that the, the wave will um, affect one beam by not changing its length, by making it fatter and it'll make one bid, bid and one, one thing longer. So it's somehow going to change dimensional space in a way that the two beams will be able to detect because they're perpendicular to each other. So it will affect more one leg than the other leg. And if it affects them both, it will affect them inversely. So it will double the effect in some way or another. But the idea is that this thing gets longer. One branch gets, you know, it's a little longer. So it takes a little more time for the photon to get to the finish line. Okay. Uh, and therefore you've measured this effect on real space the mirror moved is the argument now the question is the first question is well they say that these gravity stuff right this is supposed to be gravity stuff okay the gravity stuff affects photons so 
why would it not stretch the photons too? Which means you wouldn't be able to detect the change in the distance because the photons got fatter too. They got fatter with a longer line and so you won't be able to tell the phase difference because their phase got fatter. So that's one problem, just doesn't make much sense. The problem I'm seeing, it's a huge problem, is understanding that what they're doing is bouncing this beam back and forth against mirrors 1600 times. Okay, so each beam is 1600 times bouncing back and forth between mirrors. And, you know, you can obviously understand, uh, not obviously understand, you can understand that if I pointed out to you that we really can't manufacture a perfect mirror. That is where the surface is so perfect and so dense with atoms that the light doesn't penetrate to reflect. It just reflects off exactly one place, one place in in space is the only place everything reflects from. See, the truth is is that most mirrors, you you can go anywhere from you know pretty high quality mirrors will still go 15 atoms deep into the mirror, you know the photon before it hits what it needs to hit to make this little reflection. Now I could point out also that we know that I think we know, <laughs> I think it's kind of obvious that photons are composite objects. And only individual, some pieces will go this deep, and some pieces will go this deep, and some pieces will go here. So one electron doesn't make a photon. Photons are made by atoms uh, with a bunch of electrons, and each one of those atoms produces the photon in sequence, you know, in the right order, or they all produce it at the same time, you know, if it's like a radio wave. Um, it's a collection of electrons producing one element of the photon. You know, another one produces another element. Another one produces another element. Uh, you know, so each element of the photon, and we know this because we know polarization of a photon is very big, two thousand atoms worth maybe. You know, of polarization, very big. So that's another fact, and you know, that makes this whole thing a little bit irrational. I got a big giant two thousand atoms worth of polarization crashing into a mirror where each part of the mirror is a little different. You know, the atoms are arranged a little different and the bits will go in deeper and less deep and they're all going to get a little bit out of alignment. Um, now the wavelength of light is 500 nanometers, uh, you know, and the, the atoms are let's say 0.5 of a nanometer, so it's pretty small. But you can see how that little bit can keep adding up. You can add up a lot of nanometer differences after you banged into this mirror 1600 times and maybe knocked off, you know, five or six nanometers each time you hit it. You're going to end up with a wavelength that's all messed up. Uh, now, if you have the little piece theory, then the little pieces go in, they get all mixed up, but they all come back out again, most of them. And therefore, you can rearrange the pieces. So, different things that were called a photon, like this piece and this piece, won't be in the photon that comes back. The photon that comes back this way, well, you can't see that. <laughs> the photon that comes back this way, you know, <coughs> will have a piece from some other photon filling these two spaces. You know, and so it'd be a photon again, but it's not the same photon technically that went in, it's a different photon that comes out. Uh, <clears throat> all right, but the the key point is is that um, so when they're measuring this thing, this length difference, you know, this when it arrives at the finish line thing, the real problem is if it's bounced through mirrors sixteen hundred times, the arrival times can't be, you know, one ten thousandth of the dimension of a of a of a proton <laughs> accurate because it's got all this noise in it. It's it's completely fudged where it went into the mirror each time. So 1,600 times it went a little bit different distance. It didn't go the same distance 1,600 times. 1,600 times it went an irregular amount of distance before it reflected. How can something, you know, and it's nanometers of difference, not, not uh, you know, the diameter of a proton is like 10 to the 15th or something. It's a very, very, very very small distance, you know, uh, minus 15th uh, of, a, of a nanometer. It's an insanely small distance. How could you detect that small a distance when your ruler, uh, 
has changed its markings you know 1600 times um, how does that make sense how can they be measuring this length and a tiny 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 fraction of a distance you know the difference in the in the length how can you possibly make that make sense I can't make that make any sense how can that make any sense it can't make any sense it can't be the truth all right, so let's understand what they're really viewing, and then we can try to understand what really is happening. The real experiment. Okay, I got plenty of room up here. All right, so what happens here is, <clears throat> as this little experiment I'm showing in this you know little video clip I've played with before, this is just a piece of glass on top of another piece of glass, and the only thing between them is a little bit of dust. A little bit of dust is tilting, you know, it's creating a tilt in the glass. And the tilt is creating internal reflections. The internal reflections are creating that pattern. And that pattern is the piece of the famous interferometer pattern, which is this circular pattern. All right, now what they do, and what Mickelson Morley did, these bars change location, you know, as you change distances on the mirrors. So that's what they're saying is like a wavelength difference. So if I move the mirror a wavelength, I can make this a light bar and this a dark bar. You know, this, this goes from being light to being dark. And that would be a, a wavelength of distance. Now, they've never proven that with an experiment, but that's the, the story. And the real story is, is that, you know, what they really look at is the centerpiece. And it goes from on to off. And they're assuming that when it goes from on to off, that means there's a wavelength of difference. So let's just put an X in it when it's on and O when it's off. And so there's one whole wavelength of distance difference when it goes from on to off. Now what LIGO is saying it can do is it can detect all these little tiny notches in here in between that. So the 500, it has the 500 nanometers and it's saying it can put a billion little lines in between the 500 nanometer mark, you know, wavelength all the way off, wavelength all the way on. Now, I would argue that what we see in the pattern from all of the um, diffraction experiments, the two slit and all of these lensing effects, um, is that the pattern never is the gradual in light. It's never the gradually on, gradually off thing. It doesn't do this gradual thing. Okay, the, the bars of light are pretty solid now. Clearly solid when you see them in terms of when internal reflection in the glass is causing it. They're clearly solid. There is no, there is no gradually bright, gradually dark. There's either on or there's off. Okay, and there's just nothing in between. There's just on and off. Uh, very different than what they're thinking the pattern is. So in the first place, there's no indication that this thing has a gradual on and off. There's every indication that the line is basically built out of um, the fact that you're lining up phase and that you can take a 500 nanometer photon and you can have parts of it that might be 490 nanometers and another part is 505 and another part is, <coughs> you know, 500. You know, you can have some variation and it'll still be viewable as an average as a 500 nanometer photon. But if I make this difference too much, if I go 570 on 470, well, now it won't be a coherent photon anymore because its, it's average is going to get below the standard for that color and it's going to change the color of it um, at minimum. Uh, <coughs> But it won't be receivable because the frequency gets too inconsistent. Um, and that's what's really showing up in the pattern is that you can, you can be somewhat out of phase and still make a photon. But there's a certain line you get to where you're far enough out of phase that it's not going to be a visible photon anymore. It's too deconstructed. It's got too many elements that aren't consistent. You could argue that could be an explanation. I'm not saying that is the explanation. I'm saying it's a possible explanation. But regardless, you do have this clear indication that the, the light is more on and off than it is gradually on and then gradually off. So the very idea that you could measure this difference presumes the existence of this gradual 
uh, on all, you know that it gradually gets bright and that you could pick a spot and you know where it's just a tiny bit on you know just a little tiny bit so they're basically arguing that they can detect when when one tiny little photon exists you know it's not it's dark except there's one little photon and so therefore they can say it's now out of phase by one billionth of a nanometer <laughs> because one photon showed up and you know if there was 10 photons then they would know that's you know uh, another measure of how far out of phase they are so they think they can measure this these little sub notches they can put zillions of them in between here and figure out whether light is um, you know the difference between 500 nanometer and 501 so that's what they're saying they can do they can tell one to a billion to at least a, at least a million they can tell to a millionth decimal place the difference between 500 and 501 within a million <laughs> yeah at least a million um, that's a pretty bold claim now I right? <laughs> shouldn't bold claims like that come with really substantial evidence uh, is it too much to ask are we all science deniers because we're not too convinced they've ever demonstrated they can do all that they can see a million little subdivisions between a 501 nanometer photon and a 500 nanometer photon I don't think they can I don't think they've demonstrated they can do any of that kind of stuff um, with any experiment um, so what I would argue <coughs> as a more reasonable explanation for what's going on is um, so it gets a little bit, um, you know, it would have to be, uh, um, you know, a, a fairly comprehensive explanation just because of the complexity of what actually happens. So we're back to the half-silvered mirror and the fact that it, in three dimensions, I mean, if I was to look at it as it really is, these are just blobs of silver. And so you can understand the blobs are different sizes and they're not all the same size and the spacing between them is going in different directions. So you can sort of understand that the spacing between them is where the light goes through and it's like little mini single slit experiments. So this would be a single slit experiment, this would be one, this would be one, you know, and they would all be of different sizes and in different orientations. So your pattern is all over the place, so to speak. And <clears throat> like the what's created with the internal reflections, the pattern you get is this classic bullseye kind of pattern. So the light ends up going to um, all, like, like Newton's rings, the light goes to places where it's all out of phase and in places where it's in phase. I don't know how to draw that. I guess it would just put X's where it's out of phase, that's dark. Um, yeah, you can see that well enough. Um, and it really just has to do with focal length. So you're talking about a bunch of, you see the slits are sitting there and you've got to kind of understand that each one is a two slit experiment. So each one is kind of creating a pattern in space at different focal lengths. It'll be on, off, on, off, on, off. That it's not only creating a focus going in, it's creating a focuses that actually go out for the outer rings, you know. So it's bending light in, and it's also bending light out. Um, so it has two elements that can be in or out of phase at any one time, and those two elements will be in and out of phase as you go, as you project it through space. You can sort of understand that at one spot will be in phase from here to here, and in another spot that'll be out of phase, and it'll be in phase, and it'll be out of phase. So this, this cone that's created the cone of light going out and then there's a cone going in the other way um, so you can sort of understand there'd be places and this view if you move towards the thing you would see it go on off on off if all you saw was one of these cones from one of the slits now they're all doing this they're all creating cones in all kinds of different locations blah 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 so it gets really complicated but let's understand it, the, the experiment and what actually happens. So as pointed out, the beam splitter, okay, being half silvered, we know that the light when it goes through the beam splitter 
it's going through those openings, which means it's diffracting. Okay, so it's doing this all over the place, this spreading thing. All right, but it's also doing this. You know, this slit and this slit produce a spot. You know, and, and this slit and this slit produce a spot. And so they're combining in all kinds of locations. So there's photons going to all kinds of places. But anyway, the basic idea is, is that ends up creating this. All right, so both beams will eventually be forced to do that because both of them are going to have to go through this uh, diffraction, this mixed diffraction gradient. So it's not a gradient in one way that creates nice consistent images, you know, in linear positions. It's a gradient going this way and this way and this way and this. Way. It's going in all directions. All right, so <clears throat> one beam. You can sort of understand, you know, this half silver thing. One beam goes through and diverges through the whole experiment. That means it's diverging the whole length. And so if you have mirrors bouncing it back and forth, it's still diverging through all of that. So it would be a beam that's spreading for a long time. The other beam reflects, and so it doesn't diverge. And it doesn't diverge until it comes back and then goes through. So the last length it starts to diverge so it's going straight for the whole experiment and then it diverges at the end so you could argue kind of sensibly that well one beam is going to definitely be contributing more light than the other beam <laughs> it would appear anyway but the trick is again when this thing happened to this last beam right when it got spread going through so this is the mirror this is going through the beam splitter so the beam splitter is here and here these two locations and that's you know so they're very different beams is one point to make very different no expectation that they would look alike one beam's going to be this big and one beam's going to be this big so they're going to be very different in their sizes and again what they always are keying on is the center so the size doesn't matter as much because you're just focused on the center but the truth is the beam has little tiny elements it has an almost an infinite number of these little angles so they're still light in the center of this wide one it's still got a photon that goes straight through to the center and this one's got a photon that goes right through to the center theoretically but the more important contributors are these contributors from the outside of the beam this one won't be able to do that so it's projecting a circle here this one can project either way because when it goes through the beam splitter it can either you know it can either bend a photon down or it can bend a photon out. So at each point source on the mirrored surface, the half silvered surface, it's going to create you know, locations it'll be going to. So there are locations. And what you're really doing though, so the bottom line, what I would say they're really doing is both beams are creating the bullseye. They're just creating different bullseyes. Okay. So based on their the arc of their spread. So what you're really going to detect is the difference in this length. Okay, the amount of spread in the beam. So you're comparing one beam to this other beam's spread. All right. And those two beams are going to be in phase or out of phase in terms of lining up two bullseye. So you have two bullseye patterns essentially is the argument. And all you're really going to do is line up where those two bullseye patterns based on distance okay how f how far into that cone you are so we're back to this cone argument you know and the two cones okay you have two different cones but the two cones have places where they'll be in phase and then places where they'll be out of phase so they'll be making they already have a pattern built into them they already have these lines and all you're really doing is finding the place where the two cones line up. By moving the mirror, you move where these lines are. So by moving the mirror, you move where the on-off pattern is inside of this cone, and you're lining it up with the on-off pattern with this cone. So when one cone is hitting the target, you don't get any of the superfluous light because there's not enough photon pieces. It's again, it's adding pieces. So you need both contributions to make the ringed pattern. The ring only shows up when both sources 
are in phase sending photons to those places and the cones line up so I don't know any better way to say that but I, you know, I don't know how to you know I can't really draw a movable cone but you can sort of understand it as I move the mirror I'll change the arc the angle and I'll change at what location the on and offs are inside of this cone and that's what you're showing is that that difference and that that amount of distance is nothing like measuring the wavelength of the light measuring the cone's length the width of the cone is very different from measuring the actual um, frequency phase out of phase in phase of the light because these are very different paths that the light took some are very long some are very short um, they're very different path lengths so each one of these lines is already being made out of photons that were out of phase but they were full wavelength out of phase these lines are already the byproduct of mixing light and then you're remixing it again where you're saying if I put those two together then I can have a visible amount of photons um, but it's the only reasonable explanation in light of the fact that again there's no mirror science I know of where they could at all guarantee that they could bang a photon into a mirror 16, 1600 times and assume it bounced off of a reliably at a surface that it was exactly the same that it didn't go deeper one time and less deep the other time that they could take this noise out of the experiment and once this noise is in the experiment how do you extract it because it's happening to both legs it's completely screwing up any comparison between the two any idea that you're trailing individual photons is lost and all you end up with is averages and um, how can you how can you detect a distance smaller than the error being created by the change the variance in the distance I mean how can you measure something that small with an, a ruler like how could I measure a millimeter with a ruler that changes by more than an inch you know can't be done uh, so counter arguments welcome but yeah it's much more complicated than they want you to believe again the, the, the whole way they describe things so understand the process the first <laughs> is all these mirrors that just have to make a mess and again they, it only the mirrors only exist because what they're trying to detect from space okay needs time to affect things so if it happened faster then you would need a much shorter interferometer because the effect would be quick it would move the whole thing the distance and you could detect it without having to worry about it but it's they, they have to collect a whole bunch of it and that's the problem that's why they have to make the experiment very long but clearly delaying the experiment that is adding more time and distance the liability is is that yeah if you have to reflect it off a mirror 1600 times that's not going to be that's going to break the the value of this measurement um, it can't possibly be meaningfully accurate <laughs> anymore after 1600 adventures with a mirror um, and again the beam splitter understood uh, first the light reflects off the first surface of the glass then it reflects off the second surface of the glass so it's already reflected 15 percent or so so obviously the mirror is not half silvered because it's already reflected 15 percent of the light so you're stuck with it being whatever one third mirror so it's not even 50 50 as they describe it's 50 50 and because they've engineered it compensating for this but obviously these path length differences are pretty darn huge right I mean obviously this is a shorter path this is a shorter path how do you guarantee when the photon came back that the one that took the shorter path comes back and takes the the, the longer path to compensate <laughs> how can you you know how can you fix these biases that are built in um, to the experiment I don't think they really can be fixed and um, you know so the whole thing like again the third one would be the ones that bounce off the mirror of course but these are all different distances which is also a problem
But they say it's two equal beams when how can it possibly be two equal beams when one beam is reflections that aren't diverging, the other beam went through slits that basically diverge the light. So they can't be equal. Not really possible to say they're equal. Identical. Right. So again, the video is made for those who um, say their science is so secure and so proven and so established this guy can't deny it. So again, just as a fact, I haven't seen a single um, document that details in any way all of the tiny sounds or all the tiny vibrations that LIGO actually detected where they did some experiment where they went to a shed outside and they you know dropped a sledgehammer and said yeah we detected that I mean there's no clinical description of anything this thing has detected now maybe they think they're all military secrets or something or whatever the excuse will be but the fact that they haven't done that, that we don't have any example, like I said, a simple example, all I have to do is swing a weight, right, over the mirror, outside of the tunnel, outside of, you know, no problem, or just drive a big heavy truck back and forth next to the tunnel, something like that. They should be able to detect the motion quite well, quite accurately. Um, why haven't we been shown any of these tests? Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, so, beside the fact that the theory of a, what these gravitational waves are made out of is insane, that matter was converted into bent space, that's what they're basically saying. Matter was converted not into energy, not photons, not radiation, not any of that kind of stuff, because that stuff would move other stuff, that would be energy. It was converted into bent space. Where did that theory come from? Who tested that? What other example, what other evidence do we have that gravity, that mass, matter, can be converted? That is, the matter is destroyed and converted into a bent space wave. When was that even a discussed possibility as a theory? But this is all part of what it's, when they say they did it, this is all part of what they say they've done. And um, I just don't know why you people don't apply any kind of logical scrutiny. So anyway. Michelle, all I can do is um, you know, make my argument and say why am I supposed to be convinced when I haven't been provided any of these answers. Okay, so... Till the next time, and such. I don't need this. Uh, what am I looking for? I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for this.